Thank you. Um, we were both asked to talk about uh, nursing, and I decided that um, actually Laura's the expert on, on side effect management. I would talk more about nursing as a research nurse um, and improving outcomes. And I'm going to give you uh, talk about experience in the UK and what's happened in the last few years. So in 2001, only 4% of patients in the UK entered clinical trials. And probably only 5% of patients had ever heard of clinical trials. In 2009, the National Cancer Research Institute set up 33 cancer networks within um, the UK. And the reason that they did this was to promote trials. So how do you promote trials? Well, I don't think there is such a thing as bad publicity. Um, for many of you, you may not know, several years ago, there was a, a, a very bad, serious adverse, of, a serious adverse event in a phase one study using in human, healthy humans. Um, and everybody would think, well, you know, not going to do that again. Actually, inquiries to be a, a healthy volunteer increased by over 200%. I think one of the main things was that people found out you actually got paid for being. But a, no such thing as bad publicity. People are aware of clinical trials. And there is evidence that patients do better on clinical trials. So let's tell patients. It's very obvious that we've heard today about what happens in the real world. Um, patients wouldn't get the real world opportunity to have these drugs if, they were, if we didn't do clinical trials and get the drug actually licensed. Regular newsletters for healthcare professionals do you read them? Um, you know, we can update people, we tell you what's about, there's websites, but it's finding the time, and I know a lot of people find that difficult, but it's how to get the message out there. Advertising, I know in the, the US, you do advertise for patients to go into clinical trials. Um, I think in Europe, it, it's less popular, but I think it's going to come, I've seen uh, several websites now where they will ad actually advertise. So to promote and recruit, um, I think it really is teamwork. And as nurses, I think we're a very important part of the team. Um, you need good communication, and most of all, you need networking. And that's getting to know people this afternoon, get to know, speak to somebody that you didn't know. Um, in the UK, we've got multidisciplinary teams, and I know in Europe that's very common as well. Um, there was a study done by McNeil in 2008, and he asked the question, did multidisciplinary teams increase the enrolment to national trials? And his findings found that 85% of patients who were recommended for trials were screened. 66 of the not recommended patients were also screened. And 65% of the multidisciplinary team recommended were recruited. And only 49% of the non-recommended were recruited. So I think just talking about studies in the MDT, looking at patients, recommending them, have helped other patients as well that are not always recommended. Um, there was a recommendation from this that national trials should be flagged at all MDTs for two reasons. One, it allowed clinical trials nurses to an easy and quick means to identify patients, and it prompted members of the MDT to discuss trials with patients. So how do we communicate that with patients? And I think, you know, at every level, communication is really important with numerous patients with numerous people. There's the pe patients and the relatives. And as Laura said earlier, you know, patients take in as about 50%. I think it's probably less of what you tell them. Um, and they're there for their treatment. Oncology teams, I don't know how much they take in, but probably about the same 
Um, you sitting here today will probably take in about 20% of what's been said. Investigators and their teams, and I think more importantly, you know, the GP and the community team are becoming more and more involved in the care of people that they need to know. And I think it's very difficult um, for GPs to keep up to date with everything that's going on, not only in cancer, but in you know, hypertension and diabetes or whatever it is. So it is good communication. If you can get a hold of that GP and get him to listen, then we've scored. I think you've also got to um, communicate with the sponsor. Um, and that two-way communication between the sponsor and the investigator is really important. From the very beginning, from the time you design the study, I think we should be more uh, communication with, with the um, investigators early on and maybe give the research nurse a chance to read the protocol before it's finalised. Um, I'm doing one at the moment and we're asked to do the patient's weight every time they come and I can understand that, but why do we have to measure their height every time they come? But that is in the protocol. They want their height. And, and so far, so good. I haven't had any patients that have shrunk and I haven't had any patients that have grown. But it's things like that. And it, because we do those uh, blood pressures, those temperatures, those heights, those weight, it's something that we look at as nurses when, when we look at protocols. We're not actually interested that much in how the molecule affects whatever. But we do look at the practical things. And, you know, asking for blood tests 16 hours after you've given a patient a drug, which works out to be 4 o'clock in the morning. It's things like that that need to be pointed out before the, tri before the, con the, the um, protocol is finalised. So listen to us. Let's communicate together. Um, Jenkins and Fallowfield did a study looking at Kidney Cancer UK training programme on how to improve healthcare professionals communicating with cancer patients. And after eight hours of training, most people improved their skills and were more confident in speaking to patients about randomised clinical trials. Um, I think it's probably one of our big challenges as nurses explaining randomised clinical trials. I think the, the worst one is blinded randomised clinical trials. But patients do need to understand and maybe sometimes have it repeated several times. Sometimes the physicians also need to remember that trials are randomised and to let patients know. So networking, education meetings not only fulfil educational needs, but they are also a good way to meet colleagues. Today being a good example, um, I've met some colleagues that I hadn't met for several years in the audience and it was nice to catch up and, and know that they were still interested in renal cancer. Interest groups, um, as research nurses we have our own interest group um, and also attending MDTs. Information giving and informed consent. I think the challenge to give patients information is getting bigger and bigger. Patients want more um, information, it's quite important to them. But the patient information sheet that we give out to them is getting bigger and bigger. And patients are actually starting to object. So for sponsors in the room, please, please note, bigger is not always better. Um, at ASCO, not ASCO, sorry, ECHO last year, patients actually made a complaint about the fact that they're fed up of reading big information sheets and the other thing that they have got fed up of doing is filling in 10 pages of quality of life. Um, I think we seem to have decided what patients measure their quality of life with. I don't think it's always accurate. Um, and at that same patient meeting, most of them said that the thermometer of saying, how are you feeling today, what's your quality of life, mark it out of 100, was the best way of, of making their assessment. So maybe we're going too far. Um, communication 
you know, this is a global country and I think we have more and more uh, non-English speakers in England and the same in France and Spain. You don't have Spanish or Spain. I think we need to address the idea that patients do need to have information in other languages and that people do have learning disabilities and that we shouldn't bias against them if they want to take part in a trial. So there's different ways, things like CDs, um, videos, audio tapes that may help patients make decisions. Clinical trials nurses, what do we do? I thought for the people in the audience who don't know, I'd let you know. We give information, we gather information, um, we ensure that procedures are actually done. We're in contact with the patients, and for many of those patients, we are their key worker, and we'll have more contact with them than the, the primary physician. And really, maybe the, the, this one should have come right at the top, the safety. We try and ensure that patients are looked after safely, because that is the key. At the end of the day, a clinical trial is about, is this drug safe to give to patients, and can they tolerate it? And obviously, there's source documentation. But what do we need? Um, I've talked about early involvement already. In attend investigators' meetings. Be allowed to be released. I know of several research nurses who are not allowed to go to investigators' meetings um, because it's deemed that it's for doctors and not nurses. So a plea to anybody that has got any clout, that's not true. Um, Questionnaires, regular meetings with the investigator. I think it's one of the um, key things that I enjoy about our job is that we're a very tight-knit um, team, and I know Laura is as well with Brian, that we actually have access to the investigator to discuss them, what's happening. We need more data support. We need more clerical assistance. I'm looking at my boss now so that he can hear me. Um, and we need time to be with patients. And by having data management and clerical assistance, then we do have make the time to have patients. So recommendations, MDTs should ask why the patients should not go into a trial rather than should they go in a trial. Um, mandatory communication training for all staff involved in clinical trials, to have more nurses, to have more patient contact, sorry, contact with patient groups. Um, KCA um, is excellent. I always try and promote KCA when people say, well, who do I contact? And use of the uh, internet to promote trials. So that's my talk about research nurses. This morning we had a, a nursing symposium and nurses were invited from many, many uh, part countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had very few supply, replies um, received, and, and so we thought, what are we going to do with this time? And so we, we actually had a session um, to discuss nursing and patient education needs in Europe. And it was very productive. Um, we've got lots of ideas of what could happen. I think one of the things that we've discovered that nurses in Europe and I'm sure in the US, things are getting tighter and tighter. Trying to get time off to come to meetings like this one is actually much more difficult. Getting sponsorship from um, pharmaceutical companies is also getting much, much tighter. So to be able to come to sort of meetings, we actually need to try and motivate um, nurses into it. And, and one of the things that we would like to do is ask you physicians to motivate your staff and your nurses to come to that. But it was, we became very aware that we actually uh, need to do, know more about what's happening in, in Europe about nursing, because every country is slightly different. And I think that's one of the, of the challenges that, um, that, we, that we meet that we don't really know what's happening in different things. So I've got a few questions, so if you could all get out your um, um, things. Um, the first question was, we wanted to know 
where you're all from. Now, we were going to ask this question this morning, but it got stuck. So now's your chance to let us know where you've come from. So if you'd like to answer now, can we have some music? <coughs> okay, so the UK is evidently um, Western Europe, um, so it's a good quite a good mix of what we what we'd actually expect. So now I know that. Who provides detailed treatment education to the patient in your clinical setting? Is it the physician? I know in some countries it is the physician and the patient may never see a nurse. Is it the pharmacist that the patient goes and collects the drug from? Do they go through side effect management? And again, that's happening more and more. Uh, pharmacists are taking on uh, much more information giving. Or is there another way that you get uh, treatment education to patients? So, on your keypads, vote now. Okay, so that's great. More nurses are actually more involved. Um, what we try in our institution is uh, to be a joint approach that the um, physicians will sp speak to the patient and the nurse will either be with them or come in after to um, go over that and give written information to patients. But as I say, I know pharmacists are, are doing a lot more. And my last loaded question is, do you think there's a need for additional nurse education in kidney cancer? Because I think that's one of the um, issues that a lot of nurses are urology nurses that are looking after uh, kidney patients when their workload is probably mostly prostate, bladder, testes. So are we actually educating our nurses enough? If we are, and you think that, then it'll make our life much easier. <laughs> so, if you'd like to give your answer for that now, please. I want to do that. So, Everybody here in the room thinks that we should be giving more um, renal education to nurses. So I'm going to encourage you all that when you go back to your institutions that you speak to the nurses and find out what they'd like to do. Um, if they'd like to contact Kidney Cancer Association, we'd be really keen to hear what you would like and how you'd like it given. Because there's so many different medias now to be educated. But don't, I don't want to lose coming to meetings because I actually think networking is one of the best ways as nurses that we can learn from each other. And by learning from each other, we can actually help patients with kidney cancer stay on drug. I think that's the, the main thing to say. Thank you very much.